Welcome to tonight's episode of the Roundtable Show. I am Zod Ryder, and with me, as always, I have the panel of the Roundtable, which consists tonight of the Jackal, Yo. Irving Santiago, Johnny Alpha, 2.0, and I believe that's it, right? Tonight? Yeah, that's all for tonight, yeah. That's uh, all for we tonight. Ha- but we, we got to say, Irving Santiago's debut as a yeah. member of the Roundtable. Of yeah, that's we had. <laughs> that's definitely important. Yes, yes. Okay, you tonight as Welcome. an official as an official host. Awesome! Thank you for having I, me, guys. I think we have to give him a, a round of applause for that one. So, absolutely, you. that's epic. Round of applause Thank for you. Irving Santiago. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Now he does sound like he's on the phone, but we'll take care of that in the next uh, show, so it will be good. But Irvin, uh, welcome to uh, the round table, my friend. Tonight we have a, a really good show. I know we're all excited about our guest tonight, right? Of course, absolutely. Man. Yeah. Mr. Amazing. Brian J. L. Glass is going to be with us, and a uh, fantastic, fantastic comic book man. In fact, Johnny is a huge fan of his work, aren't you, Johnny? Oh, yeah, dude. Like, I love my Templar. I mean, I really just great, great mythology behind it and stuff. I can't wait to get and pick his brain about how he was able to come up with such a complete story and how long it took him to develop it. So, yeah, it's going to be awesome. You know, which is funny because we were talking um, a couple of days ago when I announced that we were going to have him on, and the first person that uh, jumped up and said, really, Brian, Jake Glass, oh, my God, I'm such a huge fan, was Johnny. And I was like, really? And you know him? And he's like, know him? Oh, my God, I love his work. And he started going on and on about it. So I know you're excited. I'm excited to have him on. He's a, he's a great guy and uh, does a lot of great work. So that's going to be really cool. But this week, we, we you know, we got a couple of different news things that we wanted to go over also. And uh, a lot of stuff happened this week. Um, we had the passing of the Ultimate Warrior. Man, was that not bizarre? Did you guys, and I'm, I haven't really followed wrestling in a long time because, you know, I grew out of that already. But did you guys follow, you know, the events from the Hall I of Fame I have to speech? say that I've, uh, that I followed, I watched uh, the, it was, what was it, the uh, Hall of Fame where he was on, and then he was, right. of course, a part of WrestleMania, Correct, and yeah. then he was on, uh, this past Monday night, he was actually on Raw, and then he was dead, so it was really, really bizarre, I mean, I was really shocked, actually, and I, you know, and I follow wrestling kind of casually every now and then, you know, sure. usually sure. around sure. WrestleMania sure. time, sure. I kind of follow just Dude, to see where they're at and everything, up. and yeah, he, it, it's really shocking to me, Ter- terrible tragedy, he was so young still, it's like, wow, these guys, it seems like more and more wrestlers just drop dead randomly, it's really strange. Did, only, 50, did you- only 54. Yeah, yeah, but did you guys did you guys not find it kind of bizarre like his appearance at Raw, the way he gave his speech, the things he said was almost like he was giving his own eulogy. Maybe he knew he was now. sick or something. Well, I don't he, know. What, what did he say in the speech? Well, you know, it's funny cuz I did clip out the actual Raw um speech. So if mm-hmm. you want, I'll play it here in a second so you, you know everybody could hear it. Uh it it was it, look, the way he was saying it was almost like it was a goodbye speech more than anything else. Yeah, uh, he like t- he knew he was going out. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was he, it was sad, man. He was talking about you know how the the fans, the are the real warriors, and they're going to keep the spirit of the warrior alive, even when he is you know gone because they are the warrior. You know, like that's the stuff he was saying. Uh, it was really really creepy. I mean, it was it, like if you're going to go out and you know you're going out, what a hell of a way to go out. When I was a kid, mm-hmm. I used to love to watch him when he'd do his promos. He'd just be like, oh. <sighs> Hulk Hogan, you know, I mean, he was just such a character. He was, he was insane. So, I mean, like, he is something that I actually remember from my childhood when I did watch wrestling and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's brutal, the business and the, the way these guys push themselves. So, I mean, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I don't want to act like, oh, he did it to himself because it's just part of the business, man. And, like, yeah, it seems like these guys just wear themselves out so young. 54 years old. What a, a sad, sad... Uh... Turning a uh, turn of events. I mean, from uh, being inducted. And you know, it's funny because not only was he inducted in the Hall of Fame, but when he appeared on Raw, that was like the first time he was on Raw in what, like, twenty years or something. Like Since that. He, I believe nineteen ninety six, I believe it was. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he had been banned for a long time, and uh, 
you know, he, of course, had his demons. He had a lot of personal issues over the years and stuff that he dealt with. Uh, but it was it was a fun thing to see. You know, everybody embraced him. They supposedly had made up with all his friends. He had taken pictures with a lot of the superstars, you know, The Rock, Hogan, and him embraced. And, they were, you know, they, they had been, you know, been friends over the years again. You know, it's not like everybody hated him or anything. But uh, him yeah, being Yeah, I think the Raw last was... time I remember seeing Warrior at all in, like, any kind of wrestling event was they back in 98 i think it was um the when Hogan and warrior fought at halloween havoc in wcw right. and he jobbed for hogan but uh you know and it's funny right. well he actually you know he did um tna i think also for a little bit early on did he i don't remember yeah. any of that i think he did, did yeah I, think not, he did. I don't know um, well, but, I, I know that he got in trouble and why why he wasn't on WWE is because he got too big for his britches and he tried to rip off Vince McMahon at like some kind of pay-per-view or something. And I guess that's kind of like what his big problem was, why he kind of was um, like put out from being part of like the bigger name wrestling, especially after WWF bought like everything else. So, you know, it kind of sucks that the guy was he blacklisted himself, but I mean, it, it happens. I mean, he really was huge, but yeah, you know I mean, he should have just played the game a little better. Yeah, he had a fo- he had a huge following, and it yeah, it just really is a tragedy. I mean, wow, it's it's just it's just tragic, man. It's uh, to to see somebody fall like that from grace, you know, it's just a a terrible thing. And uh, the guy, I don't know if he was maybe trying to think of a comeback or something like that, but he still had a lot of charisma. I mean, when you saw him at Raw and you saw him at the Hall of Fame speech, it, you know, you still got that that vibe, you know, from the Warrior, which is really cool. Oh, yeah, he could still do it. That was the thing. He still sounded like the Warrior, so it was it was amazing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you, you, see, you see a lot of wrestlers, they come out, they kind of just walk to the ring, and, you know, they're, 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 they don't have any pizzazz. That man, he would run out, he'd run around the ring a bunch of times, man, he'd be bouncing yep. off his shit and just like, ah! <laughs> you know? I mean, like, a lot of people, know, a lot of wrestlers don't have that kind of panaz that he had, and, like, it's kind of sad that, like, he wore himself out, you know? I wonder if, the, you know, the steroids uh, eventually had something to do with it. Obviously, you know, he was roiding up. Everybody was back then, but... Uh, I don't know how long he was doing it for because, I mean, he didn't look, uh, you know, like he was out of shape, but he didn't look as big and bulky as he was, you know, back in the day. Obviously, he's aged. He was 54, so he's going to be the same size. Uh, but it's funny. Hogan still looks about the same as he did in the 90s. He hasn't he sh- changed He's, like, much. shinier, though, man. He looks like he's made out of he plastic is... whenever I see him. <laughs> he is shinier, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, he does. He looks like he's, like, made out yeah, of plastic. Yeah, but even plastic. Hogan has kind of taken a, a less, a much less active he, role. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't Hulk Hogan try to make some sort of a comeback, you know, a couple of years ago? Well, he was in TNA. Yeah, it was yeah. a small yeah, comeback. Yeah, he tried. He had a, like a small, a bit of a small thing, and he had a couple of matches in ill-advised, of course, by everybody, because nobody to see, you know, an older dude like that going back and forth in the ring. And, I mean, I think even he realized that, which is why when he finally did come back to WWE, you know, they were smart enough to limit him to... Uh, speaking roles and things where he didn't have to really get in the ring and go back and forth with people, which, which is cool. But personally, I would have liked to have seen uh, Stone Cold uh, stun Hollywood Hogan at WrestleMania. I think because <laughs> because they did that at the beginning of WrestleMania, they had Hogan Rock. I thought somebody was going to get either stunned or, or going to get the people's elbow and or it maybe like yeah, the but big it leg like, drop. Somebody was going to betray somebody. You know, but, but yeah, Stone Cold yeah. actually said in the ring, "If you want me to." If you want me to stun stun Hulk Hogan, give me a hell give yeah. Give me a hell yeah. Excited. But it didn't happen. I mean, it didn't happen. He was just joking. I think I think if he, he would have did that, Hogan would have hurt hurt himself or something. So. Probably. <laughs> would have broken a hip. Uh, now, yeah, I, do have, so. uh, I do have the clip here <laughs> of the... Uh, Hogan's got a sex tape, man, which like, sounds really terrifying to me. You know? Yeah, you don't it's really want to see that. It's horrifying. You... It's like a parano- it should be like paranormal activity. I, I'm shocked you even know about that tape, uh, Zod, and you've seen it. That's bizarre. I would yeah, not recommend I've seen anybody it. I've seen, seen it on the website that <laughs> there was a website that leaked it. It was, and they. I would never admit to that, and, actually. Yeah, <laughs> is that something you really want to talk about? You know, that's not that's not a picture really not you want. Good. Look, that's not a picture you want in your head, first of all, Hogan and the sex yeah. tape. And second of all, that kind of, like, really rapes your childhood because, I mean, th- we all grew up on eat your vitamins and, you know, mm-hmm. do your exercise, kids, you know, be like Hogan. And then he's in a sex tape. Oh, it really, uh, kinda it really it. gives new meaning to Hulkamania running wild on you. Well, it kind of, you know what, though? I think if the, the 
sex tape thing would have came out back in the 90s when he was doing WCW, when he was Hollywood Hogan, and he was kind of a heel, and he was kind of evil, that would have made more sense, and that would have made him look more badass if it was done in the right context. But nowadays, it you know, yeah, nowadays he just looks, he's just an old man, you know, there's no... <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Age catches up to all of us, huh? Yeah. Um, I do have that audio clip. Uh, I'll play it here in a second, but uh, I wanted to go uh, over a couple other uh, news uh, items that came out this week. Uh, of course, you know, we, we've, we've all talked about this movie for a while now, and uh, it finally came out. I think we've all seen it, and uh, the yes. reviews, I think, are correct. Captain America, The Winter Soldier, the best Marvel movie, in my opinion, of all the solo flicks. I even enjoyed it more than Avengers, I will say that. Better than I'll admit Avengers. to that. I agree. I, it's I love this movie. Iron Man One, in my opinion, too. It, it is. It yeah, is. I agree with that too. I, yeah, I definitely love is better. I love, love, love this movie. I had seen it already twice. I'm going to see it again in IMAX. Uh, this is uh, the best solo picture, and again, I like the more, a little bit more than the Avengers. I will even say this is right up there with uh, the Dark Knight for me. It's right up there, neck and neck with Dark Knight. Uh, better than Rises? Yes, it's better than Rises. Uh, is it as good as Batman Begins? That's a tough one, but I'll but say it's, it's right all, up there. But you know what it is, though? The difference with with this movie, though, is it's its own thing, and it's handled in such a brilliant way. And the it fact is, that yeah. it's so, and the fact that it is such a, you know, such a great movie, and and doesn't try to be too comic booky, but yet stays in the realm of the comics. It's incredible. I mean, Brubaker's story was there. It was phenomenal. I definitely, you know, every I character can't say about this movie. Yeah. Every character perfect. in this movie, every actor that is in this movie played their part perfect. Black Widow, yeah. Captain America, Falcon. I mean, there was no miscast in this movie whatsoever. Everybody was perfectly cast. Uh they Even Robert know, Redford was great in it. They were brilliantly written. I mean, this script must be phenomenal to read through it because, I mean, the movie played out perfectly. And it was such an epic battle between the Winter Soldier and Captain America, but the ending, I don't want to get into spoilers here. I don't want to say what happens, but the ending was so brilliant and inspiring that it makes you look at movies like, you know, Men of Steel and be like, yes, why yeah. couldn't they get that kind of mm -hmm. ending for Men of Steel? Now, now, everybody stayed till the very end, right? Till after the credits? Yeah. Yep. So, of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yeah, let's go around the table and, and and all of us give us give a grade for this movie. Um, let's start off with you, Zod Writer. From uh, one to ten, I, uh, out of out of a ten, I would I would have to give it a I'd have to give it a ten. I don't think it could have been any better, honestly. All right, two point oh. Um, I'll give it eight point nine. Wow, really? Yeah, no, oh. that's still good, dude. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, this yeah. movie was much better than 8.9. Jeez. All right, uh, Alpha, what, what's your rating? 8.2. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, you know, there's no, I don't wow. believe in giving a movie a 10. There's no such wow. thing. Do like, you love it more than I did, dude? <laughs> I do but, love it more than you do, yeah. but I mean... No, it's I, impossible. He gave it a higher rating than you did, so you didn't love it more But he says did. it's his favorite comic book movie of all time. No, Hellboy 2 is my favorite comic book movie of all time. It's my favorite superhero movie. Yeah, okay. Go. Cap 3 is just going to just butcher the hell out of Old Man vs. Stupid Man when it comes out. I mean, like, there is no way that the sequel to The Winter Soldier is going to get beat by Man of Hype Part 2 and, and the goofball cast that's coming out of that shit fest. I can you know what I have to agree 100%. Uh, this movie made it uh, for me. Uh, you know, it, it made it definite that I think that uh, Warner Brothers is going to have to move that movie because they're going to lose out if they keep that date. Uh, yeah, I'm 100% now sure of that. Before I wasn't 100% sure. Now I'm positive that, that if they don't move uh, from that date, they're screwed because well, you know Captain what? Three is Marvel, going in. Right? Captain, the Cap Three is going in not only with. The buzz and the bump from this movie, but it's going to go in with the buzz and the bump from Avengers too. Right. Well, I mean, and like you know, what's what really made this movie, right? That they they got the greatest actor they could find to play the Falcon, and that dude, he really, really, in my opinion, just stole the film. And the Falcon like ruled that movie, in my opinion. And I'm really happy that they actually got a good actor and like they portrayed the Falcon as awesome as he's supposed to be because he's always one of my favorite Marvel heroes. And I got kind of pissed when they took him off of the Captain America book in the 80s when I was reading it. So I'm really happy when Brew Breaker yeah, bought him back. Go. And I'm glad that they just really, really founded him as an awesome character in the cinematic universe already. It's also, 
It's funny because that movie was so good, it actually had me excited to watch Agent of the Shield. So, I, which is a show that hasn't really been something that I've really been entertained by at all or even remotely interested in. But after this movie, I was very uh, intrigued to find out what they were going to do on that show, what the fallout was going to be. So, so, so there you go. Well, they're going to have to like go underground now, right? Basically, go all like. Well, did you see the Did you see the episode that was that happened this week? Did no, you watch I'm, it? I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm the uprising thing. No, I, I'm really excited because I heard Deathlock shows up on the show. So, like, I want to watch that first and then get to like how it is, where it is now. Like, I really I'll say this. Look, I'll say this much for Agents of Shield. It has gotten better with the events of Captain America too. I mean, it's it the, the show has a potential to get really, really good now, uh, and. With Avengers right around the corner, Avengers 2, uh, you know, from this to then, it's going to be really epic. I think the next season is going to be just phenomenal for, for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, oh it, it, obviously, it's going to continue. I mean, this show, whether, you know, it's been bad early on or not, it's still getting decent ratings. Uh, it's getting, you know, one of the best, uh, it's one of the best rated shows on its time slot. Uh, it's in the top five, I think, or something, or something like that. So, I mean, it's not like it's a failed show. It's not bottom of the barrel in the ratings or anything like that. So they're going to continue it. Uh, I don't know what the uh, developments are going to be next week or next season, but I can tell you this much. It, it is getting better in, with what we saw with Captain 2 and with Avengers coming out, uh, the Age of Ultron. It's a very good chance that this show, by this time next year, people are going to be raving about it and not bitching about it. And now we have our guest with us, Mr. Brian J.L. Glass. Welcome to the Roundtable Show, sir. Hey, it's an honor to be here. It's um, supercharged, ready to go. Let's bring on the awesome. <laughs> the awesome just got here. That's you, man. We're super excited to have you on. Absolutely. It's, a, it's I was such an honor. What those lights were. I thought it was something that I drank. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just Johnny Alpha with like the lights going crazy right now. He's just he's raving because you're you're on. It's amazing. You're on the show I'm with us. Controlling the is. lights in my house from there. This is he, this is. Stunning. Well, Never happened on an interview before. It's it's synchronicity. You and him are synchronized at the mind, I think. I know this tricks at the Scientology Church. Like Tom Cruise taught him to me, Travolta a little bit, and like, yeah, Billy <laughs> Bill. Okay, that's it. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, Brian, you you know, you're you're an amazing uh, comic book writer. You're Mice Templar is a phenomenal uh, series. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You're the co-creator or the creator of uh, the series, uh, and it's published through Image Comics. Uh, you're, what do you love doing more, independent work like that or the big stuff? I know you've also worked for Marvel and and uh, and whatnot, and you've uh, worked on a lot of big titles. Uh, you know, Is it the independent scene that really gets you charged up? Well, the independents are where I get to stretch my own creative muscles the most. Uh, I've worked for Marvel. I've worked for DC. I did one of the Adventures of Superman installments last year, yep, but yep. It's, uh, it's Image and uh, uh, Dark Horse that are really uh, giving me the opportunity to, to flex my creative muscles. Now, when did you get started with uh, Dark Horse? Was it uh, January? Wait, uh, say again, please. Uh, when did you get started with Dark Horse? Was it January? Uh, well, uh, Furious had uh, her very first eight-page short story in the pages of Dark Horse Presents 31, which came out in December. And then Furious herself debuted last week of uh, January. Very cool. There's well, a, there's a, to, no, go ahead, Johnny. Going back to Mice Templar, you have a very rich mythology and history that you kind of created with that. I mean, of course, you're kind of going off of historical events itself, but like the actual uh, mythology for the, that book, um, how long did it take you to develop that? And was that like something that you'd been working on like since for, from how long? Well, uh, the the very original concept of Mice Templar being a book about mice with swords called the Mice Templar was the baby of Mike Oming. And he had that going all the way back into the 90s. And he developed a, a six-issue synopsis that was very much inspired by his, his interest in Joseph Campbell. And uh, in 2003, he was ready to return to the Mice Templar. So what, 2003, that was 11 years ago. And uh, he dug out his old outline and really saw that uh, a decade before, what he had written was beat for beat Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. And he knew it at that particular time, he didn't feel he was ready to be a writer-artist yet of like a sprawling mythology piece. 
So he asked me in, uh, I, it was February or March of 03, if I would come aboard my Templar. And his, his quote was, build me a world. And he said, take or discard anything within that six issue synopsis that he had created. And uh, so from 2003 to the book's debut in 07, I was building that mythology. Wow, so we're talking about a good four years of you just like developing it from his, picking his brain. That, that is incredible. And like that, that's almost kind of really um, humble of him because he is quite a crea um, great creator himself. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Rapture and Victories as well. So, I mean, working with him and like he really is a creative talent himself. Like, what was that like? Oh, well, I mean, my, my relationship with Mike goes back to 1989. We've been friends for a long, long time. And uh, I feel if Mike were to have tackled Mice Templar today, uh, he would have told a magnificent tale, and it would have been 180 degrees divergent from what we've been doing for the last seven years. But Are you giving us a preview for a reboot? <laughs> No, no. Well, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think this, <laughs> this world is pretty much standing as is. Uh, Mike is the first guy to, to say he's in awe of, of uh, the universe that I built for him, that I built for us. Because we're, we're definitely co-creators. And uh, as of the new volume debuting last year, uh, me and Mike talked it over and we made uh, Victor Santos, who has been drawing Mice Templar since volume two. Uh, so that's like the last five years. We made him an official partner, so it is now a three-way creation. Very cool. So there were talks at one point about an animated film. Is that still going, or is that kind of like off the table now? Well, our, our first year that we debuted, we were optioned by Cartoon Network. And uh, how, how this whole game works, there are... There are sub-studios underneath the, the master corporate entity. So Cartoon Network optioned Mice Templar because one of their sub-studios wanted to develop it. And in the year that they had access to it, that sub-studio bent over backwards trying to develop uh, a version that the suits upstairs would approve and the problem with Mice Templar is ultimately it's a very adult story, both in story content, in execution with its violence. And the problem came down for the suits upstairs that how do you translate that into something that will be a young adult slash kid friendly for the amount of money they would have to spend. So ultimately after a year, year and a half, the, uh, the suits at Cartoon Network passed on it. And uh, since then, we, we were optioned once by a video game company. Uh, we currently have a role-playing game company knocking on our door. And there is yet another studio interest in the franchise. And uh, I really can't go into any more than that at this time. Right. I mean, like, I don't get why they would act that way. I mean, sure, it's a bit adult-orientated, but, I mean, I grew up reading Usagi Ojimbo, so, I mean, like, your book is really no more hardcore than that, and I don't see really why it would be too scary for kids, but, I mean, I guess they know best. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's goofy if you ask me. Ah, well, I mean, it all comes down to money in the end. And uh, yeah. we, we know there are ways that this series could be done. It's just it's getting the, uh, the right production team with the right vision who can convince the right money people that there, there's gold in them there, Hills. Little mice gold. Well, I mean, you, it really is. It's a rich mythology that you created with the owls and the mice and, and the different characters. I mean, it, it, it's, in, it's incredible. I mean, and, like, they're really able to do Ninja Turtles with some teeth nowadays. So, I mean, I don't see why this would be unattainable to them. But, like you said, it all comes down to the big money. But, I mean, like, honestly, you guys, Harvey Award winners with this. I mean, it's, it's gold already. So, thank you. they're lost. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Furious, um, it's a great little um, non-traditional superhero um, deconstruction. Like, how did that come about? Whoa, well, do we have an hour and a half? 
<laughs> Actually, we do. <laughs> oh man! You said you were a talker. Uh, let's see how well of a, uh, of a story we can give us here for an hour and a half. Oh, well, we've got three amazing issues so far, man. I mean, I'm really wow. just, really love the ish, the the art style. I mean, I love Dark Horse's kind of cartoony ish looks that they pull out sometimes. So, I mean, I'm really big and furious. And yeah, I'd like to get into how that came about. Well, were, were you aware that the art on Furious is by Victor Santos, who I also work with on my Stemplar? Yes, I did. Yeah, he's, uh, he's fantastic. Uh, he, he originally was not my vision for it. I, I thought as I was developing it that it really needed to be one of those like uber-realistic uh, portrayals. So I, I needed my arm twisted a bit to go with Victor but as soon as the first issue was in the can, I looked at the art and just went, wow, this is like, I, I, could, I would have never asked for, for this approach. He has been uh, astounding to work with, e even better than all the years I've worked with him on Templar. Now, do you, do you let him like, uh, go off and do the artwork the way he envisions it, or do you give him kind of ideas of how you see the characters and what they look like and what they should look like, what the scenes should look like? Well, on, on Mice Templar, I, I hold a pretty tight rein on the storytelling. Like and, a boss. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> like a boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, a little bit. I, I like to think like an editor, possibly. Ah, okay. <laughs> or, or as an art director. Ha, ha, ha. And also with Mice Templar, Victor is coming off of designs that were originally pioneered by, by Mike Oming, who did the first arc and designed the look of all the original characters. So when Victor came aboard Furious, I didn't want to subject him to the exact same thing, so I truly gave him carte blanche to design the characters as he saw fit, and design the look of the book, the style, how the storytelling was going to flow from an art perspective, and the only time I'm going to step in is if he has designed something that I felt actually did not work. And as of yet, he's delivered nothing that I would say did not work. So I'm really looking forward to our getting the green light for volume two, which should be any day now, because cool. then I'm going to actually write a little bit more towards what I, I feel are his strong points and giving him sequences where I can go Marvel style for three pages. And nice. I know Marvel DC style are now a bit archaic terms, but uh, <laughs> yeah, for those for those listening who don't know, there was an era where DC required full script panel by panel breakdowns, and Marvel style, the house style, was you would write a synopsis of what each page would be, giving the artist total freedom, and then the writer would come back and fit his dialogue around the artwork. And what I, what I, the, the marriage that I have found works really well is, yeah, when it's, when there's importance in the text and the dialogue, or if I have a specific mood involved, I want to write Marvel style. And then when I can just let go for a, a, a slew of pages, frequently action scenes, and just allow the artist to follow their muse and take it as they will, uh, I love doing that. Uh, there's a lot of the action sequences in Mice Templar that are me just letting Victor, I'll write in the script, ah, here are three pages of uh, Carrick or Cassius or Leto kicking ass. And I'll tell him, here's the general beats we're looking for, have at it. And then we come back and there's a consequence to the battle and I will micromanage the, the visuals of that response. So it's, it's, it's a really good give and take. By the way, Brian, I got to say, I got to compliment the the hardcover editions of the Mice Templar is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I was yeah, looking at absolutely. the pictures earlier, and uh, the cover work is just phenomenal. I mean, Victor uh, Santos did, the, did those cover work also, right? Well, no, the, the covers are all painted by Mike Oming, and okay. they are beautiful. We have uh, there are five collections currently out. We distinguish a collection from a volume. Mm -hmm. Because to me, a, a volume is the designation I apply to exploring an idea. So volume two was entitled Destiny, and we explore, the character explores their destiny before deciding to take destiny into their own paws. 
but the collection <laughs> got split into two completely different volumes. So, or two, two different collections. So right now we've got the struggle of we're doing a four-volume series in Mice Templar, but there are currently five collections. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah, you got um, part two, um, point one, and part two, point two. Right. But, I mean, like, they're, they're nice and big, you know what I mean? It's not like you're yeah. skimping, so I don't mind buying the two different um, volumes or collections to the, the volume because, I mean, like, there, there is so much there, and then you get the sketch pages, that is just, and then the, the script breakdowns in it. I mean, like, I'm holding um, the 2.1 of Destiny right now in my hands, and it, it really is, dude. It's a bit oversized. The panels are just so great. I mean, and I, I love that it's not a dust cover, that it's actually printed on it, because I hate dust covers. You always got to take them off and put them someplace, and they always end up getting bent up. So, I mean, like, these... <laughs> Jackal's right. These really are just beautiful, beautiful volumes. Yeah, gorgeous. Thank you very much. I mean, the, the artwork over, I, I'm really more of a, of a geek for the artwork. Uh, I love stories, and I love reading the storylines and stuff, but I really love artwork in a lot of the comics. And uh, it's, you know, it's an original comic, and it's really beautiful artwork on this. I mean, my hat's off to uh, to you guys for putting together uh, such a beautiful you know artwork for the entire series. But those covers are just phenomenally nice. I mean, they really are. Yeah, the the work that Mike and Victor do across the board has been astounding. No been awesome. no complaints from this guy. Now, what do you like doing better? Uh, you know, with stuff like this where it's independent and it's your own baby and it's your own creation and you could do something original like this or do you prefer maybe going out and doing like Superman, you know, which is kind of like the safe superhero, I guess. Well, right, I mean, you mentioned the issue. You, you mentioned the Superman issue that you right. did. I mean, how how much fun was that? Was that something you always wanted to better. do or yeah. Yeah, it can't be better than doing your own stuff, though, right? Oh, not at all. Yeah, I yeah. mean, doing doing your own stuff is truly the dream come true, and uh, it it blows my mind that I've I now have multiple creations that are developing fandoms. Uh, that that just that astounds me because I, I, I I'm a fan of, of all sorts of various franchises, televisions, books, movies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, ga gaming things, and to know that I've had a hand in in creating, to one extent or another, uh, franchises that are inspiring what I hope is going to be the next generation of creators is like the most humbling feeling in the world. That is awesome. That is really, really awesome. And, uh, you know, who were some of the, the people that inspired you growing up that made you want to become a comic book artist or a comic book writer? Uh, well, I mean, I, I originally went to, to college in the 80s uh, to be a filmmaker. And after a decade, and I realized that... Uh, I was probably destined, if I stayed in film, to be a, um, uh, a, a maker of commercials or corporate films. And I just, I had this awakening moment in the early 90s of like, wow, no, I'm actually a storyteller who chose film as my medium. And right now, film is not allowing me to be a storyteller. Mm. And I did this this major, like, it wasn't quite midlife at that point. It was pre-midlife. But I made this major transition into, wow, I wish I had pursued writing to begin with. And I went, well, what writing do I know better than any other? It's, it's comics. And so I started as a self-publisher of comics in the uh, early 90s. That's awesome. And uh, let me ask you, um, you know, since you, were, you wanted to be a director, you had, do you have any plans of directing maybe some of the stuff yourself if you can? Uh, well, my, my entire education was pre the digital age. And ah. it yeah, it was really... <laughs> you're, an old, you're old school film, uh, actual film director. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I Stock actually, film. I, uh, in, in, the, in the late 80s, I shot on Super 8 film. Oh, a, nice. A scene-for-scene scene parody of Raiders of the Lost Ark called Raiders Lost in the Dark, The Incredible Adventures of Philadelphia Joe. <laughs> that sounds nice. nice. <laughs> and, uh, and we're stuck right now. We we want to digitize it because I'd love to go back in and edit it. But right now, it, it would cost a fortune to digitize two hours worth of Super 8 film just so I can play with it on the side and finish my digital masterpiece from the 80s. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you could talk... Um... Dark Horse into helping you out? I mean, they kind of helped Mike Allred do that Astro-esque movie, which, I mean, like, I'm pretty sure you could do as good or better than that film was. 
Wow. Well, that, that's putting in an idea in the back of my head. Wow. I'll, I'll have to see what, uh, what mojo I can start working either tomorrow or Monday. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, I'm a big Mike fan, too. And, like, Astro-esque, I mean, like, they kind of really helped us and put that out and get it kind of seen. I, I have a couple VHS copies of it because I'm a huge fan of his as well. So I'm sure if, like, they helped him out, they could at least you know, try to get you a VHS release for your movie. <laughs> Yeah, I'll 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 see what uh what 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 powers we can uh, exert to the cause. Oh, yeah, be Star phenomenal. Wars, I don't know if they still do, but they used to do the Indiana Jones comics, so I mean they might be yep. interested in that in some capacity. Well, it's all about to go back to uh, Marvel, Marvel, and, yeah. uh, and Disney. Oh, that's right. They, lo- that's they right. lost everything that that uh, was Lucasfilms and uh, yeah, I was Indiana that was Jones. Star Wars, yeah. yeah. No, it's Indiana Jones. Uh, Willow, all of it. Willow, yeah, Howard even uh, Howard, Howard the Duck. I was yeah. about to say even Howard the Duck. Yeah, Howard the Duck too. Wow. Howard belongs the Duck to Disney. Marvel to begin with. <laughs> what Howard the Duck? <laughs> he was, he's a Marvel comic character, so he was theirs anyways. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Howard the Duck is back home. <laughs> you know, speaking of which, you know, since you're working with uh, Dark Horse, uh, you know, how's been the uh, the mood around there uh, since uh, they lost uh, the big Star Wars franchise? Yeah, well, I mean, when when you listen to to fanboys online, there's all sorts of doom and gloom. But I honestly, right. with it within the company, uh, spirits are high. There, it, it's it, when the word was announced that they would be reacquiring Star Wars. That was about a year or so after the actual Disney buyout of of Lucasfilm. So it's like the moment that Disney buyout occurred. Dark Horse knew the writing was on the wall. So right. by the time it became official and all the fanboys were reacting, Dark Horse already, they had their plans in motion and they were taking care of business. So there's there's zero panic, uh, to my knowledge. Yeah, as long as they got Mike Mignola in the BPRD series is... Like that that's our other big half that I see that like Dark yeah. Horse puts out and like their really huge fan base that they have. So as long as they have that, I think they at least you know, got half of their fanboys still. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. They, no, they, what... they... No, go ahead. Yeah, they're they're gonna be building on some new stuff fairly soon. Just to keep yeah. keep watching their their press releases and uh Dark Horse is in really good hands. Yeah, we had Mark McKenna on uh, the show not long ago, and he, you know, said the same thing pretty much that uh, Dark Horse is uh, going to continue moving forward with good products, and you know, people that are worried that they're going to go under just because they lost Star Wars, you know, they're fooling themselves because they're. And look, they've been around for a minute. It's not like Dark Horse was, you know, just born yesterday or you know, absolutely. So they've been putting out good comics for a very long time, and it's different from you know a lot of the comics. Obviously, is different from what we have in Marvel and. DC, but uh, cinematically, you know, let's talk about that for a second. You know, you're being a film director. What do you think of the cinematic universes right now that we have in the comic book world, where you know Marvel has all these movies coming out, DC is struggling to get movies out. Um, you know, independent comic uh, books uh, haven't really done that well in the past. You know, with Spawn and stuff like that. Uh, you know, what do you think the chances are of getting more independent, you know, comic books adapted to the big screen? Well, I definitely want to see it, as I am now an independent superhero guy, or in the case of Fury, a superheroine guy. <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of neat stuff happening beside, behind the scenes. Uh, Dark Horse has phenomenal connections, and uh, th- things, are, things are looking kind of neat. Uh, in general, I think the Marvel, the Marvel Studios approach has been magnificent. They are the textbook that kind of everyone else needs to follow. Um, DC, I would really love to see them get their cinematic universe cohesive and together. Uh, I just know, don't know how long it's going to take for us to see that in a, in a successful fashion. Well, do you think that um, Dark Horse could launch maybe their superhero books like X and Ghost and um, Captain Midnight kind of in that kind of a capacity and have maybe conjoined films? Uh, I, I think in this is just me talking, and this is not me as representative of the company in any way, shape, or form. Of course. But uh, I, I feel their their best option at this point would be to get one of the uh, one of the cable stations or one of the the premium channels. Uh, I mean, just that's where all the magic on television is happening right now on on yeah. HBO and AMC, yeah. and I mean, I just we. We we discovered uh, my wife and I we discovered Breaking Bad 
heading into the climactic season. And <laughs> that, you and a lot of people. <laughs> that became yes, the here. most riveting six months of television we ever <laughs> experienced in our lives. And when it was all over, I turned to my wife and I said, we are never going to experience this confluence of events ever again. And there was like this great loss <laughs> that, that we true. were never going to find a show of that quality with that many seasons already under their belt, entering the finale and cramming it like that ever again. Uh, actually, have you seen Dexter? I have not. Uh, I've heard mixed uh, reviews on how it all uh, bloodied up in the end. <laughs> well, I personally love the ending. I thought it was poetic and, and perfect. But I, I'm a huge fan. But if you want to get that same kind of a feel, that you okay, Breaking Bad, that would be the show to watch. Honey, she she's next to me here in the room, listening to all Dexter. the fun. Dexter, we got to go for it. And here's a comic book connection: Michael C. Hall, the star of Dexter, is now being looked at to play Daredevil. On the oh, Netflix wow. original series, which great I, idea. That's God, I hope idea. it happens. Oh, I hope it happens. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> perfect look. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael C. Hall or his work, but I mean, this guy looks like he stepped out of the Marvel comic books as Daredevil. I mean, he just looks like Daredevil, like Matt Murdock. He's perfect cast for that for that movie or for that franchise. Uh, I don't know if they're going to springboard into you know cinematic universe or anything like that, but right now it's being uh, looked at for TV for Netflix. Which that's another avenue that Dark Horse could you know really look at. Netflix is yes. a big player when it comes to movies, independent TV shows. Uh, you know that'd be a great avenue for for Dark Horse. Uh, I think personally, the one franchise that I think they should push another sequel to is Hellboy, because uh, yes. I'm such a huge fan of the first two movies. I'd, I'd love to see a third one. I yeah, think absolutely. That, I think that would be the perfect avenue for them to really uh, bring forth more of uh, you know the, the Dark Horse universe after that. I think Baltimore or like one of the other connected stories would be a great film addition too. Yeah. Or a Lobster Johnson film, of course. I'd love to see Bruce Campbell as the lobster. Mm. Yep. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of great characters uh, in in uh, Dark Horse. I mean, of course, also um, have, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'd love Dark to Horse see and, Victories, uh, man. But like, they would have yeah. to go on HBO or something way um, way heavy to get like a Victories show because that. That is so messed up. <laughs> this is a great series. <laughs> yeah, Mike is doing amazing work on the victories. I just, I'm, I'm digging it. I, I love following him doing something that I'm not connected with at all. Oh yeah, because well, like the first arc is called Touched, and like of course you weren't going to think that it means the way that it means in the story arc. I mean, because when you get to figure out like what exactly Touched means in the in the context of the story, you're just kind of like, ew. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> And then the, the 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 character, the jackal. I mean, he's just so disgusting and brutal. I mean, hey. I, there's no way. No, no, no. <laughs> no, yeah, you, no, no, dude, ja, no, jackal. You are disgusting and brutal. Well, no, no, well, that's guy, true he's, too. But... He's kind of like the, he's kind of like a version of the <laughs> Punisher that ain't scared to like bend a guy over and get at him. I mean, he's Whoa. He's, he's disgusting, dude. Not that I'm not that kind of disgusting, Alex. No, yeah, I mean, like you just share a name with the poor guy. Brian, you also do a lot of convention stuff. Uh, I, you know, I've seen you around at different conventions and uh, how much fun is that for an artist like yourself oh con conventions are the lifeblood uh, right uh, yeah a lot of times my wife will even tell me I'll, I'll go through a very down period and then she witnesses me go off to a convention and I come back and after meeting fans and introducing brand new people to my various uh, projects I just come home revitalized and that that I just I ride the wave for the next month you know unfortunately he's not on the air right now with us because of uh, his connection uh, kind of crapped out earlier but uh, Irvin Santiago one of the co-hosts here on the network uh, on the show the roundtable he actually uh, is the uh, runner of the Ultracon of South Florida um, are, you, are you familiar with that convention at all? I, I am not. Uh, I can easily be, uh, be swayed into having an interest in that convention. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to send you the link. I, I would love to have had him on, on the show if his connection uh, didn't pop out on him. But uh, I'm going to link you some stuff that you can check out. Um, it, the Ultracon is a great convention. It's, uh, every four or five months, it's a different uh, convention they do down here in Florida. So you, you definitely want to check it out, especially if you're uh, big on going to the conventions and, and, and you love doing them. Have you done conventions in Florida? I have never done any of the major shows in Florida. I, I'm oh, pretty really? much uh, uh, mostly northeast. Uh, uh, let's see. What do I do? Uh, uh, Seattle. Well, Emerald City is probably my favorite convention uh, of the whole circuit. 
Uh, C2E2 is great. Uh, uh, Reed doing New York is, is terrific. I've done San Diego a couple of times. I love Baltimore Comic Con. That's where I won my, my pair of Harveys. And I love Heroes Con in Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. You you ever been to the big one in San Diego? The big. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I've I've done San Diego a couple of times. Nice. That's that's my dream to go to that one one day and uh, see yeah. something live there. It's cool. It's become more of a film event now, right? Like just yeah, they should a bunch call it Media Con. They should call it Media Con <laughs> more than like Comic Con. Tell you the truth, but, like you go there and it's like the people from Twilight and Detergent and Hunger yeah. Games are there more than like comic book people nowadays. But Mike Oming has this great analogy he does regarding San Diego. It's like he describes it as the geeks through the coolest show on campus that no one knew about till the jocks discovered it. And then the <laughs> jocks took it over and ran all the geeks out. <laughs> That's about right. That's kind of, yeah, that's about right. That's how it happened. <laughs> yeah, I usually, I used, when I was back home, I usually went to WonderCon in Frisco. But, yeah, I went down to San Diego once, didn't really like it too much. Like, J. Scott Campbell was, like, the only person I thought was cool there, so. He's a good guy. There's a lot of good guys are there. When I'm there, I'm a good guy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> You're a great guy. Brian, like, what's some of the like across the board? What's some of the 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 stuff you like? You know that you see now that you like uh, of the current crop of uh, artists that are working for either Marvel, DC, or Dark Horse. Like, you know, who are the the guys you look at now? And you're like, you know, his work is really good. Oh, uh, why? Writing or, or art, whichever. You know, besides, yeah, gonna make me work with. Names. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm a super Bendis fan, and that's not just because I I've got personal connections. Uh, I had role. Yeah, I, I had dropped out of comics for almost a decade from the late 90s to the early aughts. And when I came back in, uh, I guess around 2005, 2006, uh, Brian Bendis' uh, runs on Avengers and some of his uh, events at the time were what really brought me back into the comics and, and showed me what I had missed for the past decade. So I'm I'm hugely in awe of everything he's doing, and when he swapped out Avengers for X Men, uh, his new all new X Men just blow and Uncanny X Men blows yeah. my mind. Uh, it's like he's he's setting the bar, and I I study some of his issues. I study the storytelling he's employing. Uh, Mark Wade, I was a fan of back in the '90s, and what he's currently doing with Daredevil just. It, again, it, it's it's incredible work. Did you read an Incorruptible by any chance? It's incorruptible uh, is one of the greatest books ever. Yeah, I've heard a lot of great things about it, but I'm not directly familiar. It's it's on my list of things to get to. As you can imagine, when you're a comic creator, you have vast lists of everything you want to read, everything you should read, and everything people recommend that you should read. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 Uh. Uh, speaking of the chat, I saw somebody. I am. I'm, I'm in the chat, by the way. Uh, somebody in chat was asking about the comic Furious that you did, Brian. Yes. And by the way, the person's name, I believe, that you're talking about is Cuddle Dumplings in the chat room. Yeah. So. Awesome. Great name, <laughs> Cuddle Dumplings. I think it's Scorpio. He's the only other guy that I know that's probably like read Red Furious, a big fan of it. He's a guy that hosts at my X-Men show with me, and yeah, we're both big fans of it. Um, also, um. Like, you have th that great little book in, um, out, but I was wondering if you had any kind of other little things like that in production, you know, kind of like in, I forgot what it's called, but that you got formulating. Do you got anything that might be coming out soon that you could tell us about? You're asking me. No, I'm asking Alex. No, I'm asking <laughs> <laughs> How this biz works is the moment you've you've got something in the pipeline with any of the major companies, and that's Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Image, IDW, etc. Uh, they want to be the ones that make the big announcements. So until I have anything that they announce, I got to keep my lips zipped and be mum. Right. Other than I'm really waiting for Furious Two to be greenlit, and maybe it already has. And I'm just leading you all astray. <laughs> he doesn't want to announce it on this show. He probably has a, another show to announce it on. Now, it's not even a question of me announcing. It's, it's the publisher. 
publisher ah. man. You know, speaking of the two big uh, companies, Marvel and DC, uh, how much has it changed over the years since uh, that you know they've been bought out now by bigger corporations like Warner Brothers and Disney? Uh, I, I would say operate, you know? I, I've never been that entrenched in either of them to have noticed the difference between pre and and post. So gotcha. I'm probably not the guest to to ask that of. <laughs> I've asked that before, and some guests have uh, has told me you know in the past that. Uh, they do see a change from the way it was ran before, but they do see Marvel as being more uh, operated the way they used to be operated. Like they're they're not as hands on with Marvel as a lot of people like to believe that Disney really kind of like lets them do their thing. Uh, that's why I think a lot of writers and art- and artists really love working for Marvel nowadays. Uh, you would so think that would be the way to go, though. You know, I mean, not to have such a big company trying to micromanage every little company they own. You would think that Marvel's been doing their thing for so many years that it should be it? Yeah. allowed. Yeah, for Marvel to just keep doing what they're doing. Yeah, they own them, but that, I mean, that doesn't matter. You know, as long as they keep putting out quality stuff and, you know, they're a business and they're, you know, their comic books are basically, you know, uh, storyboards for movie scripts. Hey, no problem. You know, it should all as it should all fan, work can, out. As a fan, I can tell you, Marvel's actually taken on a more harder edge since Disney's took them in. Oh. I mean, like their comics yeah. are more groundbreaking. They got probably more talented writers than they had before. They got Brian. <clears throat> I don't know. I would say on. that that's debatable. Being a longtime Marvel comic fan, I mean, I think Marvel has had like has had a hard edge for quite some time, even prior to that. I yeah, think you, you it's just now a... because you're seeing because you're seeing all these movies and stuff no, now. And seeing different things with well, the no, I think it, ha- it has to do with the fact that Disney owns them and they don't want to look like they're soft. Yeah, they're know? definitely not looking soft under exactly. Disney. Exactly. So, you know, they, sure. that's why I think they... I agree with Johnny. They have gone a little bit more hard edge. Uh, but it hasn't been as drastic as a lot of people want to, you know, like, need you to believe either. It's been... Well, it, a little bit harder, but not as as much as people want. Well, the thing that they, they're really, really trying to do is they really want to take on this indie-looking edge, and they really like right. just grabbed all these indie writers. They got like Nick Spencer and Colin Bunn and Anthony Johnston writing for them. All these guys that are like known for Image and and Oni Press writers, and they got all the artists too. So you look at Marvel, and they almost kind of look like how the indie books looked a couple of years ago, which I think is kind of really bold for them to run with. So I mean, and like I really hope Brian jumps over there and like it's to do some writing too because I mean like he really kind of fits the um, the stereotype that um, Marvel's been running lately and I would like to see a great writer like him at least get a couple good paychecks I would love to get that myself <laughs> Brian Brian I, uh, Brian I have a question for you yes, and I, I've yes, had, to, had this question since earlier in, in the show and I, I wanted to know what your opinion was of the current state of Superman since you did get a chance to write a, on an issue of of Superman, what was how are your feelings towards that character and and towards the current storylines that are going on? I, I uh, when I when I wrote uh, Adventures of Superman, I was really thrilled that I was writing Adventures of Superman because that was more the the classic character. Uh, he he's gone through a lot of evolutions, uh, I believe. Uh, just like uh, I'll make a Marvel analogy, the way Marvel in their movies and in the books, they've allowed Captain America to be both the the wholesome 1940s guy that is still pretty kick-ass as a current relevant uh, window on the world. And uh, Steve Rogers as a character is astounding, yep. and I feel that's what they've got to find with Kal-El with Clark Kent, with Superman. They've got to find that that Captain America connection that they've never quite connected with. That, and that's... They're not doing it and cinematically. They're definitely not doing it. And in fact, that we talked about it earlier when we were talking about Captain America 2, The Winter Soldier, how the end of that movie felt like it was so inspiring. It felt like that's what Superman and Man of Steel should have ended like. You know, something closer to that. Uh, it, it, they completely went against character in uh, Man of Steel in a lot of areas. Uh, it's you know, it's amazing what Marvel has been able to do with these characters and the way they really are telling the stories properly compared to what DC's been doing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, I uh, I definitely would love the chance to write Superman. Uh, I'm reluctant to say what my take on him would be. <laughs> So, well, can you at least tell us, would your take be something uh, drastically different, or do you just have some tweaks in mind that, that you're thinking of? I mean, 
Well, I, I think I alluded to it when I started by saying he needs to be DC's Captain America. Yeah. And yeah. you've got to find yeah. that, you've got to find that fine line between uh he's he's a hero of the heartland and he's been around for 70 plus years and he resonates on multiple levels to multiple generations and you've got to find that you got to find that way. I don't know if I'm 100% the guy to do it, but uh, I would give it my best shot. Now, are you in underwears on the outside or underwear on the inside type of guy? That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's be- the it, whole new 52 reboot with the costumes, man, it's, just, it's bizarre to me. It really is. In real life, I'm definitely an underwear on the inside <laughs> kind of guy. But when it's on the comic page... <laughs> You don't mess with 70 years, 75 years of, of archetype success. You find a way to make it work. Underwear on the outside. Amen to that. It worked for 70 years. Why change it, right? We'll mess with it. Right. Superman doesn't, need, Superman doesn't need armor. You know, just, Correct. Yeah. Just or, saying. It's Superman, for crying out loud. No, Batman <laughs> exactly. <needs armor>. exactly. <laughs> and you don't make it a super speedo either. No. That's the no. Flash. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, now, how, you know, as a writer, though, let me ask you, how do you get into the mindset of when you're trying to write uh, some of the stuff, uh, you know, especially the way you do it, uh, you know, how do you get into that mindset of, of the writer and, you know, coming up with stories and stuff for your comic books, especially for the independent stuff that you do that is original? Uh, well, uh, th- this would apply to the to the mainstream stuff when you're tackling a franchise character, but it also applies to when I've created a world, uh, I want every even like with with my mice, I want every character to be a very distinct, individualized personality. Uh, and in in Mice Templar, I've got a slew of animated mouse characters who almost look identical. So there are different speech patterns. There are generational patterns. Uh, the older Templar have a very different way of speaking than the younger generation do. And then when you get into the younger generation, each of the different younger characters has a very distinct way in which uh, they, they speak. And I do the same in Furious. Uh, it's really interesting. We had a, we had a reviewer of uh, Furious Number 1 who criticized the character as being badly written because I wrote her like she was uh, a Paris Hilton type. And that's exactly what she is supposed to be. So was it bad writing or was I actually right on the mark? Right. <laughs> right. So in, right. in yeah, so right in, on the mark probably. <laughs> yeah, so in, in Furious I'm also doing the story of a uh, my lead character, we're chronicling her from when she was 7 years old, 12 years old, 18 years old, 21 year old as a tabloid trash celebrity, and now as a 25 year old superhero desperately trying to do the right thing. And in all of those eras, she has to both be the character that we know, that we identify with, that we care about, and yet she's going to speak differently in all those eras of her life. And dialogue-wise, that, that, that becomes a challenge. But uh, I, I, I'm pleased with what I'm doing thus far. And how did you come up with your main character in Furious, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, well, the, uh, the actual adventure I'm embarking on of the, the, the seeming deconstruction of a superheroine in order to possibly rebuild her, I don't want to give any spoilers away, Uh, is a story that I've basically had ever since I read uh, Frank Miller and David Mazzucchelli's Daredevil Born Again uh, back in the uh, late 80s. And that story so wowed me. I I had the the privilege of reading it issue by issue uh, with 30 days in between each. And it it became one of the most riveting things I went to the comic shop for. And when it was done for many years, it, it stood as the archetype of, this is the story one day I want to tell. And initially I thought at the time I wanted to apply it to an established character. Like to, to take the character that was the least likely in the world to have a dark side from one of the major companies 
and I built this whole deconstruction story around a very fun, vibrant character. And when I realized in the early 90s I was never going to get to do that, that type of story to that type of character at one of the major companies, I found that way that all writers do. How do I take the tale that I want to tell and translate it into something that is my creation? And then the next dilemma I found was, well, for about a decade and a half, 90s into the early aughts, I wrestled with there's this story of this woman who was becoming more and more real to me whenever I would revisit the concept. But the problem was she needed to exist in a superhero universe. So my story of her deconstruction suddenly had to take on Watchmen proportions because I had to build a superhero world, build your reason for caring about her, while at the same time taking her apart. And I could never find the right hook. And very, very tragically, I'll say, it was two years ago that a a real-life unfortunate uh, tragedy uh, gave me the final inspiration to breathe life into Furious, and that was the passing of Whitney Houston. Mm. And uh, I I was never, like, I, I personally was never a fan of her music, but... I'm of an age that I remember when she debuted on MTV, and she was this fresh-faced 18-year-old with the with the, with the hippy, dancey, happy number, and and like so many, I just watched her deteriorate over 30 years, and uh, I believe ultimately when when she passed, it was Patton Oswalt who tweeted something about. Um, Everyone's acting like this is a a tragedy or a surprise, but it's not. We watched her commit suicide in slow motion, and nobody did anything. Yeah, it's the same thing with a lot of child stars, and uh, like Michael Jackson, for example. Whitney's was really, really sad, though, because she could have been saved so many times. Uh, It was almost like she refused to to be saved. She refused to help herself. Uh, Amy Winehouse, I think, is the same way also, and... She, of course, a much shorter span of time with Amy Winehouse. She wasn't around as, quite as long or the iconic. The 27. Uh, yeah, the infamous 27. It's funny you bring that up. But so many, it's funny how so many actors and singers and celebrities have died before their 30 years, for their mm-hmm. 30th birthday. It's just a, it's a terrible tragedy. It's the yeah, Logan's it's a, Run effect. Yeah. One of the great things I really got to applaud you with with Furious is because I, if you look, there's the market is kind of ripe with um, – superhero deconstructions but you've yeah. really found a way to do, do a kind of an original one with your female character that's that's yeah. different than like say sidekick or a lot of the other ones that are out there that are really tragic you I mean yours is i mean like yours is probably one of the best and probably one of the most um iconic even though um you may have negative reviews i didn't read that one but that guy's a moron is all i can say oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no he he likes this as of issue three so I'm, I'm giving him kudos okay okay you're not an idiot <laughs> guy whoever you are how's been the the reaction by the fans to the furious series so far brian oh the, the reviews have been astounding the online response has been astounding uh i guess the the one follow-up i want to do when i got to whitney houston was that in, in, the, in the wake of that, for as terrible as that was, it, it provided that spark of inspiration where I said, the solution to my dilemma is not the creation of a superhero universe, but to replace superheroes with superstardom and then reinsert the superhero. And that ended up being the magic of whatever Furious is currently becoming. So... We all, I don't have to build a superhero universe for my audience to recognize the world of superstardom because it's on our televisions every day with TMZ. Uh, you can't log on to your internet in the morning without catching up on all the entertainment headlines. And I said, this, this is the world. I don't need to build a superhero universe because a superstardom universe already exists. And then I will have her, instead of the superhero that falls, she will be the superstar who fell. And this is the path of her redemption. Whether or not she makes it, 
we got a couple more issues to see what happens. That's very cool. How long of a run do you think you're going to give uh, Furious? Uh, well, d- deep down, I, I don't want to... I don't want to commit to what I did with my Templar, where when we did Volume 1, we were committed to 30 to 40 issues right out of the gate. That's how long that story was going to take, need to take to be told. Uh, with Furious, I have at least eight arcs I would love to tell with this character. Uh, all these different facets, because while... While she was publicized as the first superhero of her world, the key word there is first. Uh, the, the plan all along was for, for me to get to the arcs that I really, really, really want to tell, I do need a superhero universe. And so she is but the beginning. So you're, you're going to find an issue four. The, the is, There's no spoilers here. Okay. But uh, the, the issue that's coming out uh, the last week of April, just in time for C2E2, oh, is, go- yeah, is going to be an issue where uh, that reporter, uh, Jesus Martinez, who's been with the series ever since the, uh, the Dark Horse Presents short story introduction, he finally gets the chance to interview her on, uh, before an audience. And he hits her with the point-blank questions of, well, uh, have you ever considered what a foreign government or maybe our own covert intelligence agencies would do to understand how you've achieved what you've achieved? And in that is a germ for future volumes as to where this is going. Because if there was a superhero in our real world, uh, absolutely would foreign governments, absolutely our own government would be crawling all over them to discover how does a superhero fly? Right. How does a human being do what no other science has been able to discern? So she is under a microscope that she is not even aware of, and that is the substance of future volumes. That's very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. I, I love the the fact that it's uh, looking at it from a realism standpoint. In fact, speaking of which, uh, do you like that in, in the cinematic universe also for a lot of these comic book movies, uh, the realistic aspect or realistic take on these characters? Do you think that's the proper way to go with these? Or do you, do you arcing back to like the 90s when they were more comic booky, fantasy, uh, campy oriented? No, I, I really love the balance that Marvel Studios has struck. Because they're, they're touching on all the familiar that you recognize. I mean, Thor looks like Thor. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's not like a blue spandex suit, but I don't see Asgardians wearing blue spandex. It's, they, 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 right. they have found that marvelous way, no pun intended, <laughs> they, they have found that, that wondrous way to uh, make what is very real in the comic palatable in the real world and i would say that is the effect i'm going for in uh, in furious that uh, the the reason she wears the costume that she does is that is her idea of what a superhero costume would be that's not what professional if professionals get into the superhero gig they're not going to dress like furious does Furious, uh, one of the other criticisms I I recently read in a review was how unrealistic or uninspired her costume design was. Well, I take great pride in what Victor Santos did. Victor thought he put himself as a designer in the head of Cadence Lark, the alter ego of Furious, and went, here's this woman secretly privately deciding to become a superhero, what kind of costume would she create? She's not a costume designer. She doesn't have... She's not going to go hire designers. It, was, it, was, it wasn't Kryptonian technology that gave her the suit like in Man of Steel. So it, it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And in, in the original Dark Horse Presents story, I had her... She, she writes a speech for herself. And it was really neat to have her... To have her write a speech when I'm the writer, but she isn't. So to actually put myself into her head and say, okay, she's an actress, but she's not a writer. 
She never got credit as a writer. She's not interested in being a writer. So when a person not skilled at being a writer decides to write her introductory speech, and it's the most ham-handed thing you could imagine, and that was intentional on my part, and it backfires against her. In a similar way, that's the approach Victor Santos took to the costume, that her costume would be something that this woman who has never designed a costume in her life, she's never had to make the costumes she wore on movies or television. So what would she create? What is that, what is that midpoint between what she conceives of in her head versus what she is physically able to create. And I thought Victor knocked it out of the park with the design. I think he did too. Like, like I said, the artwork is beautiful on the, the entire thing. But, uh, you know, even looking at the, some of the, the people, and there's a young lady named uh, Ashley Hay who just up in cosplay uh, not long ago for you and, and showed up at, the, at your booth. Uh, just looking at that in live you know, film or live pictures, it looks good. I mean, it looks like a real superheroine would look. Uh, so I think the artwork is fine. And then, speaking of which, uh, it would be that would that be the way you would like to see a representative that ever get done gets done like a movie? Would you like the look to be just like the way she portrayed it in, in real life? Oh, I, absolutely. And please, I want to give more 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 internet love, more radio love to uh, to Ashley Hay. Yeah. Uh, look her up online. She's on Facebook. She's on Twitter. And uh, we're actually going to be doing a feature on her creating that costume, cool. uh, aided and abetted by some other assistants. There's another fellow named Brian who worked on the costume with her. Um, that uh, We're going to do a feature on her in issue five of the comic. And she'll be appearing with me again one of the days of C2E2. Also San Diego, also New York Comic Con in the fall. So Furious is going to make some live appearances at quite a few shows, thanks to how awesome Ashley Hay is. Now we have a question in the chat room uh, from, from Big Bird. And Big Bird wants to know, are any of the superheroes based on real-life characters, or, are, or are, they, are they all off the top of your head? Uh, could he please clarify what he means by... Any of the superheroes. Well, uh, I mean, let's say for example, any example, of the you characters know, you've created, right. essentially, I guess. Right, right, right. Would be. Like, uh, like uh, Cadence, uh, like for example, that character. Obviously, we know that you molded that character after you had the inspiration with Whitney Houston, but that was an original creation even before then, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Cadence Lark is, and greetings, Big Bird. Thanks for the question. Cadence Lark herself is an original being. In many ways, she is an amalgam of all of the – a multitude of these young child stars that enter these turbulent teenage years. Uh, I mean, I, I'm of an age where I grew up watching the cast of Different Strokes uh, Guilty. Dis disintegrate, disintegrate before our eyes. And now it feels like we're in the process of watching uh, our current two biggest pop stars – are currently trying to out outrage each other, and all you have to do is see who's tr trending on Twitter any given day of the week to see which which of those two stars is trying to destroy themselves faster. So in many ways, Caden Slark is this amalgam of all these different people. Uh, there are different aspects from from the flaming red hair makes her look like one of them. The fact that she was a child star uh, with a pair of triplets equates her with some famous uh, twin duos that have been out there. But deep down, all of the details of her life were originally constructed. Uh, I've charted her entire family history going back to her grandparents. There's a very specific reason in issue one that Sam Cooke, a singer from an era totally out of her time, yeah. that there's a reason she's a fan of Sam Cooke. Someone, someone actually uh, contacted me and said that, was, that, that I was showing my age by having to be a fan of Sam Cooke. And I, my response back to them was, well, gosh – she lost her mother at seven years old, and you don't know yet who her mother was. 
And so there's logic behind all of these things that that she loves. Um, you may have noticed uh, throughout the series, she will frequently, through her inner monologues, channel back things that are of a very childhoodish nature. And again, that's intentional. She's a character who lost her mother and sisters at seven years old. And so there is this, in her monologues, there is this subconscious desire to want to go back to the child she was when her life was perfect. And that means she channels a lot of who her mother was when she was just seven years old. And uh, so, yeah, so Cadence Lark herself, while inspired by a multitude in the media, is a wholly original character that I'm very, very proud of. That's really awesome, and I, you know, I just wanted to point out to you, Brian, though, just for just for your own knowledge, um, Big Bird in the chat room is female. Just to let you know. Oh, awesome! <laughs> uh, good to know. By the way, is did, that right? did I did I somehow <laughs> allude to maleness? Uh, you said, yeah, yeah. You you said you said he. Well, with a so with a name like Big, well, but, a name like like Big, Big Bird, Bird is yeah. kind of ambiguous. But I just wanted yeah. to you know point that out because oh, okay. very um, very important information. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I, I, don't worry, I'll, I said don't worry, I'll correct him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm looking at the chat room and yeah, Big Bird is ta- it's taking a little bit hard that uh, you called her a he. Oh, oh, Big Bird, please. I am so terribly, terribly sorry. I, I literally, I'm, I'm sitting in my living room with the computer in front of me. My wife is, uh, is close by. We've got kitty cats. We have a kitty cat right now who's currently sick. His name is Mr. Moto, so we've been very concerned about that. And when oh, I no. hear the name Big Bird, I immediately equate it with the Sesame Street character who, who was male. So please, please, please accept my apologies. My thing is, if you don't want to be called a dude, don't have a dude name. Like Big right. Bird. Nah, I won't, oh, wow. won't go there. Won't go there. That's simple. But, that's simple. <laughs> but but I mean, like, on. <laughs> that, that guy saying that um, you, you're old for knowing who Sam Cooke is. I mean, I know who Sam Cooke is because I like listening to oldies radio. I mean, that, that, some of these critics are just kind of moronic, don't you think? Eh, well, I mean, everyone's going to review from whatever their own particular perspective is. And... Uh, one of the things I've noticed about eight, there's the old cliche about uh, when you're young, your parents are idiots, and the older you get, you realize how wise they actually are. <laughs> and, and it really is the the older you get, the more experience you accrue, and uh, you you can either stagnate in where you're currently at or absorb all the different eras that you've been a part of. And hopefully, to continue to be a vibrant writer, I'm I'm bringing experiences. From the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, and now the uh, the new millennium teens. Nice. Brian, listen, we have a caller who's joined us, Scorpio Moon, uh, who's a, a host of his own show on podcast. Uh, he's on here. I uh, wanted to ask a question. Scorpio, welcome Excellent. to the roundtable. Hey, thanks for patching me in, guys. Welcome, Scorpio. Thank you. And thank you. I also want to start by saying that I love Furious. It's one of my favorite new comics that I've picked up. Recently, you know, Dark Horse puts out a lot of good stuff, but I'm a really big fan of the non-traditional superhero kind of genre, and Dark Horse is just hitting a lot of the right beats for me, especially with your book, Furious. Yep. Thank you. Um, a lot of your comments have kind of, I don't want to say confused, but maybe surprised me. Like the idea that you looked to superstardom as something to do instead of a superhero universe because you couldn't take an existing character. But it seems like what you've done has worked, I don't want to say better because I don't know what else you had in mind, but perfectly. Because it seems like she's going through the whole thing again. Like when she was growing up, you know, like a child star gets too much fame, too much money, you know, too much before they're emotionally ready for it. And it seems like with her superpowers... She's going down the same path again where she's got too many abilities before she's emotionally ready for them. And this girl just seems like a train wreck. She's just beating on everyone and trying to figure out. It didn't really seem until issue three until she really pulled it all together. Well, uh, you're definitely picking up on the corollary that I'm creating that despite her best intentions to now want to be a superhero, uh, she is still the person she was. Uh, And that's anyone that has uh, made that come to that point in their life, made the decision where, ah, I want to stop this habit. I want to stop being I I've come to that realization. I'm my own worst enemy. How do I change? Well, the act of changing, you are still your own worst enemy. 
and that corollary between how her superstardom could have been a power for good, and yet she perpetually made all the wrong choices uh, because the people surrounding her, I mean, these young stars are surrounded by enablers, people who profit off of them. So, I mean, today, someone like Justin Bieber, he is not an entity unto himself. He's now a corporation. And I know there's the whole argument, oh, corporations aren't people. When these stars achieve a certain level and they employ dozens to hundreds of people, they themselves become a corporation. And as long as, you're, as long as you're making money off of the corporate brand, you protect the corporate brand. And so you get, you get Michael Jackson's. In a way, dare I say, you get George Lucas's. Where who's ever going to tell him his idea is bad? You know, it's funny you mention that because Lucas started off as, you know, of course, an independent filmmaker, wanted to do his own thing away from Hollywood, and he ended up becoming part of the institution and selling out to Disney, the biggest yeah. corporation. Well, he, he, even before that, he became the entity that could not be questioned. And, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so now here you've got, uh, you've got Cadence Lark, the, the child star, who was enabled her entire life. And you, you'll find out in future volumes how her father was not quite the bad guy that volume one paints him to be. Um, it just you're going to feel as equally bad for her dad as you feel for her under her dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so you've got these characters that are not answerable. The, these these celebrity figures who are not answerable to anybody, and and they get enabled. And by the time they become adults, where your average child who spent their their teenage rebellious years then has to find a way to uh, to quell those inner fires and mesh with society into their 20s, into their 30s, if they want to survive. Mm. And these stars grow up with a decade or more of they can do anything they want. And so now with, with Furious, uh, her decision to be a superhero, just because she has decided... This is this is what I want to do. This is the right thing to do. She's treating the police like the paparazzi. She's still, well, you can't touch me. Before, I was a star, and you couldn't touch me because my money could buy me out of anything. Now, I have superpowers. Where Who's going to apprehend me? Who's going to take me in? Who's going to hold me accountable? And all of this is going to come to a head in the opening pages of issue four where Furious finds herself in the position of being judge, jury, and executioner. You know what's great about stories like this also, uh, Brian, is the fact that the audience could really connect from an early age, uh, because you, you know the way the timeline is set up, that you're do showing different parts of the character's life during mm -hmm. the, you know, the run, uh, you can really have the audience really, you know, you can really capture different audiences because of that. And uh, is, is it me, or is it always the best stories come out of personal tragedies? And usually when it's a big loss, like losing your parents or a sister or you know something like that, usually makes for the best storylines anyway. That's what Batman taught me. Yeah, Batman, even Superman lost his yeah. parents, you know, grew up in Kansas with adopted parents, then lost his adopted father uh, to a heart attack or mm -hmm. the wind, if you want to look at Man of Steel or whatever. <laughs> uh, the wind blew Pac at the way. It was not the wind, it was a Sharknado that took him away. <laughs> It was Kevin Costner anyway. <laughs> I was just yeah. happy to see him die. That would actually would have made more sense if it was a Sharknado, honestly. It would, it would have been much cooler, that's for sure. Uh, Instead man, of them doing cool. Sharknado 2 and just another tornado with sharks, I want to see the sequel be a political thriller and they have it called Sharknado. Ah. Oh. That'd be interesting. Oh, that's good. Did I just say <laughs> that out loud? <laughs> you know, you just gave everybody there a great idea, right, Brian? You can join the conspiracy theory shows we have on the network now. Are you guys aware of my Area 51 caller? Oh, no. You have an Area 51 caller? Please do tell, because that's what most of my shows are based on, off of this show. So you're, you're not familiar with this? You don't know about my connection to this piece of UFOlogy? No, please tell me. Uh, you remember uh, Art Bell, Coast to Coast AM? 
Oh, of course. Oh, hold on. You're talking about the Area 51 caller on our bell? The Area 51 caller. And okay, I know that one. Yep. Uh, you're talking to him. It's the weirdest no. thing in the world to take credit for. Uh, hello, Art? Um, wh- what we're talking of is aliens is actually the backstory to uh, me and Mike Oming's 1990s comic, Ship of Fools. They are not what they claim to be. Yes, you're talking to the Area 51 caller. No, Brian, you're kidding me, right? Uh, I am not. Um, oh, my goodness. Are you serious? That is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, uh, me, Mike Oming, David Mack, we've been talking about this online for like the last decade or more since it happened back in 97. Wow, you're kidding me, dude. Talk about ironic. Man, you know, in December, I just started this show on Dark Matter Radio Network, which is owned by Keith Rowland. Uh, he was the webmaster for Art Bell for 20-something years. I don't know, man. Wow, that's awesome. That's that's phenomenal, though. I, you know, it's funny because a lot of people still believe that that was a real call and that person really worked at Area 51. There's still people that believe it. Oh, there, there's conspiracies within the conspiracies. The, the yeah. challenge that I give anyone, I've just been talk. I've been doing this interview with you guys for like the last hour. Uh, just listen to my, go back and review the show, listen to my speech pattern when I'm just talking and answering you guys' questions. Everybody who actually knows me in real life, there's no doubt in their mind that I'm the Area 51 caller that I claim to be. Because you, you listen to that guy's call, yes, I'm putting on an act, but it's me, hook, line, and sinker, and it's the backstory of Ship of Fools, me and Mike's book from the 90s. Now, let's let's be honest here. Did Art Bell know right away that that was a, a, a hoax, or did you know that he fall for it also? No. Well, that particular night, part of the gimmick of Art Bell was he would do those open line or those specialty line nights. So one night the line would be time traveler line, and so he would pick up the phone and conduct the interview with whoever was on the line as if, well, they're a time traveler, and then one night. <laughs> One night he did vampire line. So whoever was on the other end, oh, well, obviously they're a vampire. I'll talk with them as if they're a vampire and interview them. And on that particular night when I called in, he was doing Area 51 employee line. And when I made the call, it was, I wasn't trying to fool Art. I wasn't trying to trick anybody. It was, I made the call as part of the the fun show business of his show and it coincided with a satellite going out that was not <laughs> my doing or his doing which is the other part of the conspiracy yep. it was a it was a GE satellite lost earthlock and mm-hmm. 500 stations went down that night his was one of them, and it just happened to be in the middle of that freaky-ass phone call. Which is why everybody was freaking out and thought it was real for a long time. And I yes. remember you went you went on Art Bell, and you admitted that, that you were the one who called, and it was all a joke. Uh, it was an act. Yes. I remember hearing that. I didn't put the name together, but I remember hearing the phone call where you called back, and yeah. you were on air. And, and then you did the role play, and you did it again on air, so everybody knows that it was just a joke. Yeah, and like part of the other was I, I'd been in communication with Art uh, off air in between, but you have to understand he's in a position where he didn't know who I was. He had the integrity of his show uh, to, to, to consider, and at that time, I was looking for publicity for my comic Ship of Fools in the 90s. I, I had a career, and I saw this as like, wow, here's the gold mine. Like, we made this legitimate call. Let's profit off of it. <laughs> so when, when you, if, if you go back, you can find them on YouTube. It's a Area 51 Frantic Caller, and I think Area 51 Frantic Caller Confesses. And you'll hear my voice. I introduced myself as Brian. You'll hear the same exact yep. voice. And uh, when you hear all that tentativeness at the beginning, it's because I wasn't sure if Art was going to allow me to keep talking or whether I was going to be abruptly cut off or whether he was going to open the door for me to freely talk about the Ship of Fools connection. So that's all the hesitancy you end up hearing in my voice during that call was, I I didn't know what was going to (laughs) happen. That was such an epic, epic night for Art Bell. Oh, my God, that was such a a brilliant call. And you sold it so well, man. I mean, I remember hearing that when it was 
you know, when it was happening live, I was listening and I was freaking out because I was like, oh my God, it's real. Area 51, aliens. I, I almost crashed. I'm going to be honest with you. I was on the road and I almost, I had to pull over. That's how epic it well, was. Well, you, you, you do realize that <laughs> everything I'm saying was absolutely true. They're, they're going to triangulate on this any moment now. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh man. You know, man, as soon as art is available, uh, you know, when he comes back, he's probably going to broadcast in dark matter radio network. And I would, you know, I would love to have him on my show. Uh, that's just kind of a dream of mine to one day be able to interview art bell. But if I can get him on the show ever, if I can make that happen, I am definitely going to contact you because to have both of you on would just be just special. I mean, the uh, art bell and the actual area 51 phone caller. I mean, I, I would love to see what art has to say to you so many years later. I really would. I, I would be honored to do that. I'd be thrilled. I mean, to me, Art has always been a stand-up guy. I've, understa- I've understood his position. So uh, I, I never wanted to be like a, I know he, he was the victim of a couple of people that tried to exploit him. And I never wanted to be perceived as one of those guys. So if I could be on the air with him and we could talk 15 years after the fact about the Area 51 caller, that would be magic. I'm definitely going to try to make that happen for you, for me, for Art, for all of us. Because that, man, I would love to be involved in something like that. I really, really would. I think that would just be amazing. Uh Unfortunately, we're almost out of time on the show here tonight, and uh, we definitely got to have you back on, Brian, because uh, it's just been just a pleasure having you on here and talking to you. I uh, love your work, and uh, you know, again, we're all big, big fans of yours, and just uh, we really would like to have you back on soon. Oh, I'd be thrilled to do so. I mean, there's, there's plenty of stuff coming up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, what do you have next coming up before we let you go? What do you have uh, coming up? Well, uh, before the end of the month, bleeding right into C2E2, where I'll be there with my colorist, my Mice Templar colorist Serena Guerra. I believe we're sharing a table at C2E2. Um, but the week leading into that, uh, Furious number four and the return of Mice Templar Legend with number nine. And it's been designed so that even if you haven't read Mice Templar before, if you're just a fan of Furious and curious about Mice Templar, pick up Mice Templar Legend number nine. It'll have a big, like, starting point number one on the front. I learned my Marvel lessons well. <laughs> Mice Templar point now. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, all new Mice Templar. Yeah, well, no, awesome. that might be all new because we're closing in on the grand finale within the next year and a half. But also, this Saturday, I would remiss not to say, if you live anywhere in the, uh, the Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware, tri-state region, I will be appearing at Steve's Comic Relief in Levittown, Pennsylvania, this coming Saturday, two, two days from now. I'll be there live in the flesh with, with books and uh and selling furious and uh come out make it a good time that's awesome what's your your website address give that out also for anybody listening who wants to check out the other uh, website okay i'm at uh brian uh all as one word it's brian with a y not an i like all the other famous brians in comics <laughs> i'm the other brian and uh i'm also available on twitter at bjlg my initials and I'm on Facebook, so track me down like the dog I am. That's awesome. And uh, hopefully you can get down here to Florida and we can see you at uh, UltraCon of South Florida. That would be awesome to get you down there. Yeah, invite me. I will come. Definitely. I already, uh, I've already put the information towards uh, Irvin Santiago. Maybe he'll contact you pretty soon about it. Fantastic. Uh, but it's, it's been awesome having you on, man. We unfortunately have to sign off in a couple minutes here for the night. Uh, so we definitely got, got to get you back on pretty soon so we could you know, keep talking because now you're really uh, intrigued me with this Art Bell stuff, man. <laughs> that is so Our cool to have you on the show. We'll, we'll that is so cool to, a... to have you on the show on that. That's, that's amazing. We'll just make you a host like we do most of the other guests that come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's happened twice already, yeah. Uh, I don't have the yeah. time to do this weekly, unfortunately. Ah, I hear you. It's tough. Trust me on that. Uh, but with that said, guys, uh, any last questions for Brian before we, uh, we sign off for the evening? Anybody have any uh, last words? I, I just like. I think it's so cool that you're friends with um, David Mack as well, dude. Like you, you're too cool. You just know all the, like all my favorite um, creators. So right Thank on, you. man. They're all working, great dude, people. I know. Do you know Billy Tucci too, by any chance? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Billy Tucci's a great wow. stand-up guy. Damn it, yeah, dude. You know them all, then. Right on, bro. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that kind of happens when you're in the industry there, Johnny. You kind of like make friends. It's called the web of, of people that you meet. You, know, you create a little web around yourself, and you, you, know, you make friends and you keep them. That's how you get connected, right? No? It's, all <laughs> it's all about networking. It's all about networking. You keep the good ones and you distance yourself from the creeps. That's <laughs> correct, yeah. And if Indeed. you're lucky, you just go on hiatus for a while. <laughs> Ooh. Ouch. Anyway, with that, we're signing off. Good night, everybody. We'll see good you night. next week on the roundtable. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>